Hey guys, Jared here. Uh, first of all, if you can't tell by the sound of my voice, and if you're watching this on video, you can't really tell just by looking at me. I am a little under the weather. I did not have the strength to fully talk for an hour and a half for a CTN podcast today. So today you're going to get Nate Marquis hosting full time and Brandon Sanders joining him once again. Really want to thank both of those guys for accepting the challenge and taking on uh, recording this episode today. I really appreciate that we can get, still get it out to you guys. Um, so shout out to them. They they did awesome. You guys are really going to enjoy the episode. Uh, the other thing I want to throw out here is uh, I made a couple of mistakes when I was doing some of the production stuff and there was some notification noises and some an ad popped up when I was doing some research at one point during the episode. And I did my best. I tried to find a way to edit it out. But unfortunately, there wasn't really a good way to do that without taking out the awesome content that Nate and Brandon were talking about. So if that comes up, my apologies. But even still, it's an awesome episode. Really appreciate you guys tuning in and check it out. Welcome, everybody, to Chasing the Natty. Our fearless leader, Jared Palmgren, is under the weather today. So it'll actually be Brandon Sanders and myself, Nate Marquise, piloting the show for you guys today. Week four has come and gone, so we will recap the week that was, discuss a few new players on the freakout scale, as well as a whole new set of waiver wire pickups for you guys. So all this and more coming up right after this. Zappi looking to Jared Stearns who makes the catch and scores. What a burst! Trey Vaughn Anderson! As advertised, touchdown Buckeyes! This is Chasing the Natty, a college fantasy football podcast. All right. The uh, the week four recap has thrown us a little bit of a curveball. So uh, with Jared being under the weather, he's actually uh, working behind the scenes as our uh, as our producer today. Uh, and so I have uh, Brandon Sanders with us today, man. Uh, how the hell are you? I'm good, man. How are you? It's uh, it's it's been it's been an interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, um, it's been a good morning so far. I, I actually went on a, a a cancer walk with my family to awesome. uh, to raise some money for for cancer. So uh, it's been a it's been a fantastic morning so far. Um, I'm ready to get into this and, and just kind of recap uh, uh, the week that we saw on Saturday. Uh, first off, let me let me just say I had a chance to listen to the tailgate show that you were. Uh, uh, that you were on Saturday morning as I uh, did some lawn work. Fantastic job by you guys, by the way. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was uh, just the two of them. And I, I was like, hey, uh, I knew you guys are already on early on the Better Sports uh, Network there bright and early. And I was like, let me see if I can hop on, give a little bit of CFF analysis there Why Jared was under the weather there. And uh, it was a good time. I really, really enjoyed myself. And uh, it was free flowing. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, we even had I think one segment by Jericho on there still, so it was still a good time and uh, kind of kind of does it as well. Uh, I've learned now to uh, set my my lineups and stuff, make sure they're a little bit more secure and not running to the uh, lineups right but right after the uh, tailgate episode. So, uh, word of the wise, if you're going to be a guest on there, is to make sure you keep track of your lineups before the end of tailgate. <laughs> yeah, man the the that that time slot right before games kick off is always just a, a frenzy of trying to figure out who's in, who's out, and and, and how everything's going down. So yeah, you got to get that stuff squared away beforehand. Yep. So I, for those of you that are wondering, Jared is with us today. He's, he's kind of like uh, on late kick, Josh, he's Jesse working behind the scenes. <laughs> so he, he's handling the, the producer's side, but uh, it'll just, uh, it'll just be myself and Brandon here today. What uh, tell me, Brandon, what games kind of had your attention the most on Saturday? What were you sure. focused in on? Sure. So that would have been my team playing at 3.30. I got to watch – my main one I watched was Kansas versus Duke, which I thought was a really good one, mainly for the DFS side of things, just because that was one of the games we highlighted on the Bet on C2C podcast. But I was really just intrigued to see the battle of the unbeaten basketball teams all of nowhere. So right. now there's really just Kansas. I think Duke went down. My team went down yesterday as well. Uh, I'm not sure how uh, Kentucky – I think they won. So I think they're still – 
hanging in there as a basketball, but they've, they've always been a decent football school nowadays. So, right. but that's the one I checked out. Uh, Jalen Daniels is an absolute monster, man. Like I know he's a pickup guy we were talking about last week, but that guy is very startable. I mean, uh, he looks like he has the, uh, the gambit coming up. He's got some tougher opponents coming, but uh, he's, he's, he's showing out pretty well. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, who he has. And even Neil would be banged up most of the game. Their, their secondary running back did a fantastic job and uh, Duke's nothing to laugh at. They, they have a pretty decent, uh, you know, offense too. So it was like, it was a good shootout. I enjoyed it. Yeah. We live in a world where Kansas actually is sitting on top of the big 12 after, after four weeks in un- so un- crazy. undefeated Kansas Jayhawks. Uh, and obviously Oklahoma state's undefeated as well, but I mean, you got to give it, give it up to Kansas. They have wins against West Virginia, uh, Houston, and now Duke, which are all three, you know, or uh, that's, that's not three games that Kansas is winning in the past for sure. No, so uh, Lance Leipold is, is certainly going to be a, a hot commodity as the, as we, we get towards the end of the year and, and staffs are, are going to be replaced. And he's certainly going to be somebody that's going to be considered by a lot of programs out there. What was, uh, what was one of the games that you checked out? I would say the most of my focus uh, was on the Texas Tech and Texas game. Yeah, that was a good one. Uh, that, was, that was really entertaining. Things got wild. Texas kind of blew it there at the end. They had a 14-point lead in the third quarter. Um, I, I, I was on – I hopped on the um, College Fantasy Tonight, our Sports Center type show, yeah. with Matt Bruning um, on Saturday night, and we obviously discussed that game. And the best way that I could describe Donovan Smith – uh, was like he's he's bipolar. Uh, he's yeah. a bipolar football player. Like he, he can on on the same series make some throws that make you think that no other player in college football can do that, and then he'll make some throws that make you wonder if if he was even like what he was even seeing. It's just wild to watch just how volatile his um, his game can look. Yeah. Uh, did you did you get to catch any of that game? I, I got to see the last of it as uh, Kansas and Duke was wrapping up. Uh, yeah. I even said on the tailgate, like wonky things happen in Lubbock when Texas comes into town. And I yeah. the gut told me to take Texas Tech, but I just wasn't ready to pull the trigger on that. So I went Texas. But man, there's always something weird going on there. Uh, that, that place is crazy. They they start yeah. like the fans are known for throwing tortillas everywhere. I don't know of any other yeah. place. It's like, hey, we're gonna throw tortillas at people and. And it's going to create this crazy ruckus environment. But yeah, I mean, I, I obviously my Sooners did not did not play well. But one of the games that I had circled on the schedule was we have to go to Lubbock at the very end of the season. And I'm like, man, that that's just going to be a rough spot to be if 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 Texas Tech still has something to play for at that time. So mm-hmm. good win by then. The the other game that I was looking at was uh, was Clemson and Wake. Yeah, and that game was that game was wild. I, I just. There's no way anyone could have predicted the the Clemson D would get caught in a shootout. And that's yeah. exactly what happened. I mean, Wake just kind of did their thing. And um, DJU went off. And, and here we are, four weeks into the season, DJU looks to have secured that job after all. Yeah, I was listening to you on a College Fantasy Tonight with Matt and uh, just the, how you were telling, uh, you know, just the who would have thought that right. Sam Hartman, two weeks removed from not even playing football at the moment, now is in a, a gunslinging match of his life against Clemson and yeah. how we have yet to see the emergence of K Klubnik almost to like DJU's just, it's not like he's doing enough. He actually did pretty decent to where mm-hmm. uh, I wouldn't say that question is put to bed just yet, but I think we should, um, you know, squi- you know, calm that down for at least a few games while we see DJU kind of do his thing. Now he'll go up against some tougher opponents too, but at the same time, like, He's doing pretty decent. I mean, he's, he's, it looks like the DJU that we saw coming off the bench with Trevor Lawrence, you know, being injured yeah. that one game. So that's, that's pretty decent. Yeah. It's, yeah, uh, they obviously he has built some equity that uh, it would take a really, really poor performance in order for, for him to find this spot on the bench. But um, yeah, just an incredible story with, with Sam Hartman and, and obviously Wake Forest was uh, Clemson defense was missing some, some guys in the secondary as well as yeah. Xavier Thomas on the defensive line. So that, that certainly played a role. Uh, I'm sure their defense will bounce back. Got a great game. I think game day is going to Clemson at NC state or oh. I think it's, I think it's at NC state one of the, but those two are playing. So that'll obviously be a great matchup coming up this week. Um, real quick. I had to, so <laughs> 
I'm sure neither one of us want to dive too deep into um, how our uh, how North Carolina played. Or I've had a day, so I, I'm a lot <laughs> I'm more even killed today. But I might go on a rant about defense. Just heads Let's, up. So we'll we'll try to keep it positive here on the show today. We don't want, <laughs> we don't want to go down into a dark place. But I did want to I did want to bring up. I thought it was crazy that Drake May had to. He didn't necessarily have to apologize, but he oh, did apologize. For those NC State comments, I guess he, what was it? He basically said um, everybody wants to go to North Carolina as their first choice or something like that, that nobody really wants to go to NC State if you're from the state of North Carolina. I'm like, yeah, that's what rivalries are. Absolutely. I feel the exact same way about Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, man. Don't apologize for that. Own that. Yeah, it's a joke that's been around for literally since I've, you know, I'm in my 30s. It's been around since I was a young kid. It's like, if you can't afford Carolina, you go to NC State. It's the <laughs> ongoing joke because no one wants to go to Duke because it's a private school. You got to be a doctor or something like that, right? So right. it's like, you know, that's the ongoing joke. And that's something that even Drake and his brother, Luke, you know, all those guys, that's that's what his dad was a quarterback there at UNC. Probably he was saying the same thing, you know, 20 years ago. So it's like, it's an ongoing joke. It's funny. It's meant to, in, you know, to ignite the rivalry. We played them in a month so it just gives more fuel to the fire for the nc state fans and we still consider them a rivalry and especially in football basketball just depends on the team and that's another joke there you know so it's like you know it's just good fun but the fact that the university pretty much problem was probably made him apologize it was kind of silly uh just because he did it in his tone and everything he was doing it just jokingly he's right he's a good kid he's got a level head on his shoulders it's not like he's doing it he's just taking small jabs at his rivals he's it's fun it's the acc yeah. man so it's yeah. like I hated that the university almost had to make him do it, but he's a good kid. He probably felt a little bad afterwards, but it is what it is. It's right for Yeah, absolutely. Real quick before we, before we hop into some of the, um, you know, some of the things that we want to discuss today and do the freak out scale. It was kind of a weird weekend in that it did seem like there were more injuries that either broke right before the games kicked off or even during the games, there's just kind of a short list of, of some guys that came, came to mind. Xavier worthy left in the second quarter, did not return. Looked like maybe yep. an ankle uh, JSN. I discussed this with, with Matt Bruning last night. Sounds like the hamstring is still not quite there. So they're kind of taking, taking their time with, with him. Hayden hooker gave me a scare, man. He got, yeah. he got smashed on his shoulder and looked like he was going to be done for the day. And that guy just fought through it like a champ. Yeah. Um, uh, Puka Nakua at uh, at BYU uh, again uh, had had to, to walk off the field early in that game and did not return. Um, Anias uh, Anias Smith of Texas A and M looked to have a pretty serious injury. Blake Watson was this late scratch for Old Dominion. Uh, Keelan Stokes had just a, a, a gnarly um, you know uh, video of him taking a head injury for Tulsa, the wide receiver. So hopefully he's. He's doing okay today. Um, it sounds like Brant Keithy uh, tied in for Utah, may have torn an ACL. So mm-hmm. we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, Sumo for North Carolina State left, but um, it appears that they're just saying that was, you know, hey, it yeah, you should be pretty much, go. pretty much we're playing UConn. So <laughs> uh, yeah. he got a little dinged up. Not. He got a little dinged <laughs> up. He's going to be fine. Uh, I don't know what this deal was with with Keaton Mitchell, but he yeah. only had like five carries in that game. So I don't know if he got hurt. Champ Fleming was a late sit. Uh, and then obviously Aiden O'Connell um, did not play for Purdue. And and now Brom comes out and says, I don't know, maybe he'll be out a few games. We don't well, know. Yeah. So obviously that's a that's a big one. That guy was averaging like 400 yards a game. So uh, just some just some things that we want to keep uh, keep an eye on. Um and then a couple of things here. We'll we'll do a little bit of housekeeping. Jared would uh, would would not be happy if I if I glossed over this. So we want to make sure that we give uh, a little bit of the spiel here uh, from Jared. Obviously, uh, chasing the natty is part of the campus to Canton team here. It's it's the best place you can find all of your CFF C two C and Devi information. Um, our CFF team here consists of uh, obviously Jared Palmgren, uh, myself, Nate Marquise, Brandon Sanders. Chris Moxley, um, and and just to kind of run through a lot of the uh, the podcasts that we offer. Like I said, this is just a, a great source resource for you to find any of the um, college football Devi information. Uh, we have uh, Chasing the Natty, which drops uh, on Monday mornings with myself and Jared, and then we've got the you know that is recapping the week uh, that was, and then we'll have the second Chasing the Natty with Jared and Chris Moxley that lands on Wednesdays. 
previewing the games upcoming, the week's upcoming games. And then we've also got Campus Life with Colin and Austin that lands on Tuesdays. Canton Life uh, with Colin and Austin for the NFL side that lands later in the week. And then, uh, Brandon, you've got a uh, bet uh, on C2C that lands on Wednesdays, correct? Tell, tell the people about that one. Yep, so you can definitely check us out. Usually we drop Wednesday morning bright and early for you. Of course, that's uh, me, uh, our other host, Chris K and Ethan Sowers, a part of our uh, DFS team here at Campus of Canton, where we take you through all the things as far as DraftKings, uh, price picks, and stuff like that, just to help you win some money during the week and uh, you know, enhance your CFF experience. That's what we're all about. Absolutely, man. It is uh, just a totally invaluable resource there. Uh, if, you, if you do play DFS, uh, if you don't, what are you doing? You need to. It's a blast. Um, but yeah, great, great, great job there by Brandon, uh, Ethan, and Chris. Uh, also, the uh, Devi debate, uh, one of the flagship podcasts lands on Wednesdays, back to Devi on Fridays. Uh, and then, of course, you can listen in live, as I mentioned, with the uh, the tailgate show that that, that comes on Saturday mornings, uh, previewing all the games, talking about the, a lot of the uh, a lot of the things and places where you can wager your money. Uh, and then the College Fantasy Tonight, the Campus to Canton Sports Center style show that lands uh, that you can watch live, uh, listen in live on Saturday evenings or listen to on Sunday mornings as well. So. Uh, obviously, so many sources to um, to feed your your college and uh, fantasy needs there. Uh, and obviously, wherever you listen to your podcasts, uh, please, 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 please give us a, a five star rate and, and leave a review that helps out uh, so much. So let's get on to our freak out scale. So for those of you that have listened in the past. You will know that I put together a, a freak out scale that I do every year, letting you, um, you know, kind of take a look at, OK, how freaked out should we be based off the poor performances of, of particular players? And, um, and then that can range from very low. You know, these are these are like I had people asking me about Marvin Mims after week one. Don't freak out. Start those guys. You know what I mean? They don't. It's yeah. Some guys you just can't freak out. And then as you start to, you know, work your way up the scale, we, you know, right around three out of 10, we're, we're concerned. Five out of 10, we're looking for some backup options. Seven out of 10, we're benching these guys now. We're really concerned. And then high as a 10 out of 10, these are, these are dudes we need to drop and they're, they're clogging up roster space for you. So uh, Brandon and I will discuss a couple of guys here. The first one, man, I know Debbie, Debbie people are going to be screaming at me as I discuss this because the, <laughs> the, the stands for Jameer Gibbs are real. are they are for real. And um, <laughs> I'm not saying I totally get it uh, because I, I have certainly talked about him a few times. But let's talk about Jameer Gibbs uh, for a minute here, Brandon. I'm going to give you some stats and then you tell me. On a scale of, of, of zero to 10, how freaked out you would be from a CFF perspective on owning Jameer Gibbs. Um, let's, just, let's just take the, the last couple games here, for instance. He's, he's actually been fairly consistent from a rushing and receiving standpoint. He, over the last, last game against Vanderbilt, he had three carries, 21 yards, no touchdowns. In the receiving department, he had three receptions, 43 yards, and one touchdown. Very similar to the week before against ULM, four carries, 36 yards, four receptions, 65 yards, and a touchdown. So obviously the, the receiving component here is carrying the day for you if you're starting Jameer Gibbs. Brandon, where, where are you at as far as being freaked out about him? So for me, it's like if the receiving touchdowns weren't there, we'd probably – We'd probably be singing a different story. However, he's always been a decent, you know, uh, receiver for sure. And that's what we did it. We had the discussion, you know, like a year ago, he's at Georgia tech. We don't know if that's, you know, going to be good for Debbie. Well, and then he moves to Alabama. So now he has no excuse whatsoever. So these teams like ULM and Vanderbilt, like he's supposed to be blowing them out of the water yet all of Alabama, except for a few receivers is, is struggling, you know, as far as overall, uh, we're seeing a different uh, Alabama one that's trying to, uh, you know, it's not necessarily close, but considering what they should be doing, this is a attack concerning. I feel like they're still trying to gel, get their stuff together. So for me, it's a five. I'm looking at other options, but at the same time, you paid a high price for Jameer Gibbs. So 
I would probably say look for a backup. There are some other guys that I'd, I might would start over Jimmy Gibbs, but it'd be very hard for me to take him out of a lineup just yet, especially with the receiving touchdowns. And if those disappear, it becomes a very high eight for me, and I would be sitting them immediately. So what was your thoughts, Nate? Yeah, I get that. I want to pull up uh, his – his next two games producer Jesse if you could do that for us that would, <laughs> that would be great um while that's while that's happening my freak out scale is a little bit higher for him um I have him at about a seven here's the deal I am benching him versus bad teams he's he is the inverse of what you would normally do from sure. a fantasy perspective against good teams against Texas he was needed he caught nine balls. He becomes the focal point of their offense against, against bad teams. Less so they have so many different weapons. They, three carries just isn't going to get it done. I don't, I don't care how good you are. Three carries. You, you, if you don't break off a long run or a long pass and, and the, the touchdown that he had against Vanderbilt was was really nice, but you just can't count on that. His next two games, Texas A&M and Arkansas. So those are, those are both games where I don't know that Arkansas or Texas A&M have the offense to keep up with Alabama, but they're good enough teams and there's enough talent in those games. It's not Vanderbilt. It's not ULM. You can probably start him. So he's kind of like a five out of 10 for me in those types of games. Um, but when, you know, when they play some of the lesser uh, opponents, I believe in one of your playoff weeks, they have I wa- Austin P in, in, in week 12, that's, that's a terrible, terrible game to have to count on him to get the volume that you need. And that's a playoff game. So those, those are concerning. So for me, it's a seven against, against bad teams. And it's a five against, uh, against formidable teams. Yeah. Let's move on to a, a running back room instead of just a particular player here. But let's talk about the Northern Illinois running back room, Ontario Brown, Harrison Whaley. Uh, both of these guys were being drafted, you know, in the top half of your drafts. And, and, and there was always the issue of maybe they split, but this offense would be good enough running the ball to where both of them could still eat. And the problem we're running into lately is that that hasn't been the case. Neither one of them have cracked 100 yards yet on the season. We're looking at three tu- 100 yards per game, sorry, but three touchdowns total for Ontario Brown, one touchdown for Harrison Whaley. Um, how concerned are you with this running back room here, Brandon? Um, pretty decently. Of course, I've been the, the Harrison Whaley truther, I'd say, out of okay. between the two. I didn't jump on the Brown train with some of the other guys, like our friends like Bainbridge and, and Josh, who was really big on Brown and stuff like that. I think both of them are very talented, but I'm starting to get pretty concerned. So I've actually benched Whaley. I haven't had to play him, honestly, in a few months because – there's some of the options that I picked up on waivers that are doing a lot better or guys in a dynasty that I've held on to. So here's a couple of names that uh, I would be interested in more than this running back room, Toa Tal of Nevada. I mean, he's actually doing pretty decent, even though Nevada is terrible. At least the running game is doing pretty good to go along with it. Uh, Jalen Coleman from Duke is actually doing really well, stuff like that. So there's a couple of other running backs I'd rather have than both of these running backs right now to actually play. I'm not even comfortable playing them in a flex. So I'd probably say right now between both of them, I'm, I'm probably at a seven. I'm benching them for right now. I'm not freaking out yet, but I'm definitely, you know, starting to be like, I have other options that are better. So I'm playing them over these guys. So I would be sitting them for sure. Okay. I think that's really a good point. They, it is getting hard to justify starting them at this point. I will say the one thing that changes, and this will kind of be a recurring theme as we go throughout the show. Yep. We're, get, we're getting into action. We are hitting yep. that point of the season, and the last couple games against Kentucky and, and Vanderbilt, SEC teams for NIU was a, a little bit of a struggle because they had to work from behind. Yep. Early in the year against, I believe it was Eastern Illinois, the game one, both of them had fantasy-relevant type games. So maybe we kind of get now, but I totally get giving them a seven here and wanting to see it happen first before you're willing to throw them back in your lineup. So I'm, I'm cool with that for now. Put them a seven. You can't drop these guys, nope. but, but you want to, you want to see it first, but Maxion's on the way, which is, which is going to be a nice relief for the two of them. Last guy we want to talk about on the freak out scale here. Um, man, what a, what a pitiful display it was yesterday. And, mm-hmm. 
This is somebody that, that I highlighted coming into the season as uh, a, 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 a serious stock down for me based off of the coaching change. And that is Tyler Van Dyke over at Miami. Uh, against Middle Tennessee yesterday, he saw a benching take place as they got they got their they got their butts kind of handed to them by uh, by Middle Tennessee State. So um, a benching happened. I want to say it was in the third quarter, and then Jake Garcia came in, played okay. He was fine. What do we do about Tyler Van Dyke? Um, how freaked out are you, Brandon? I mean, just. Just listen to what you just said. They had a beatdown by Middle Tennessee State. <laughs> Man, like, like who, who, got, who, that, got, who got murdered by James Madison in, in week one, I believe. Uh, Middle yeah. Tennessee State. Middle yeah, Tennessee the, State. And James yeah. Madison had a hard time against App State. So it's like not even the, the highest of highs in the Sun Belt, right? And they're right. still taking it to a Miami team that was ranked. Not anymore. <laughs> probably not anytime soon. Uh, you know, they're going to fall right down the scale. Uh I, I'm 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 not playing Tyler Van Dyke, so he's definitely a seven. He's sitting. My- I'm a ten, man. I I I think I think I'm sorry. I think I'm I'm dropping him. I, I don't I don't think I wait any longer. This is a guy. Okay. Not not only do we have the issue of the system, uh, he can't produce against G five teams. He's now going up against ACC teams. Um, not sure. that that's not that that's great, but it's it's. Tougher than G. So it's tougher than Middle State Tennessee Clemson, State. Yeah. yeah, it's tougher than the. It's tougher than the program. Oh, it's tougher than the program that, um, you know that gave up a bazillion points to James James Madison. But yeah. I think my my concern is is that I already was super. He was already kind of at a seven for me coming into the season, and now we've added in the fact that there's a potential QB change that mm-hmm. might take place. He's got somebody nipping at his heels. That's a concern. Yes, they have North Carolina coming up next, but do you really, do you really feel confident, even against a bad defense, that he's going to produce or that he's going to be able to hold on to this job? I mean, uh, you know, Notre Dame's not anything to laugh at, but they weren't that great either. And look how nice they looked. I mean, it's granted they have Michael Mayer, who's going to be, you know, he reminds me of Travis Kelsey so much. The dude's just some, yeah. Yeah, and plus, uh, you know, no receiving options other than maybe Lorenzo Styles when he feels like playing, you know, that day and stuff like that. So I don't know. Maybe Tyler Van Dyke maybe has one more chance to keep his job, especially against UNC. It could be done, but it's when he plays NC State or he goes up against Clemson where we might have to see the change of the guard and see what Jake Garcia is really all about other than what we see out of him at, uh, on Netflix. So I'm interested. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm dropping, man. I'm a full-on 10. Like I said, I was at a 7 coming into the season. <laughs> I'm, I'm now at a 10. Um, okay, that wraps up our our freak out scale, guys. Let's transition into some waiver wire pickups. These are guys that are you know rostered below forty percent uh, ish on fan tracks. So um, obviously we we now have some roster ship percentages that we can go by again, which is great. Um, and we can make kind of a seamless transition here because the first guy up, we'll discuss quarterbacks first. Our first guy is Chase Cunningham, quarterback, Middle Tennessee State, who we just saw put an absolute thumping on Miami. He went for 408 yards with three touchdowns, one INT um, in the pass game, and he's not irrelevant in the rush game. He has, on the season, 35 carries, 57 yards, and two touchdowns. So he tends to get used a little bit around the goal line as well. How are you feeling about him? I mean, we're talking about a guy that's less than that's that's right at three percent rostered so far. Yeah, uh, he's definitely a sleeper for sure. Uh, Four hundred eight's great. I see where you know he he does throw an interception at least the past three games. If he can control that, he'll be a lot better. He is coming up against what I think is going to be easier competition. Uh, so I think he's definitely rosterable, uh, especially at 3%. Why wouldn't you take a fire on him? He might be even a good spot start every once in a while, especially when you're coming up against these matchups where you have a SEC quarterback or maybe you have a guy in the in the Big Ten or something like that, and you just know it's a rough matchup. And you're like, hey, man, Chase Cunningham could drop 400 yards and definitely give me like 20, you know, easily 30 fantasy points. And, you know, look what we saw with – uh. With Austin Reed there at Western Kentucky, just dropping 30 points like it's nobody's business and just yep. handle business against Indiana. So, uh, well, not Indiana, the other team, but still, that's kind of the stuff that Chase Cunningham could do uh, against a good matchup. So uh, he's definitely rosterable. I think uh, he's a good pickup for me. Yeah, this was a situation prior to the season. 
where I really like their OC hire. He, he kind of comes from the, the, a, a real spread based air raid type of offense, new OC that they hired from a lower level. And, and obviously middle Tennessee state has had some success with quarterbacks in the past. It was just hard to trust that are, you know, is this offense ready to take that step forward? And it, it looks like it say what you want about Miami, but they've been good on defense so far this year. They're a disaster on offense. They've been pretty good on defense. So I think that there's, I think there's real opportunity here. Next guy we'll discuss is somebody that uh, most CFF players are, are quite familiar with. Blast from the past. Uh, that's right, man. Former Alabama quarterback, uh, Lane Hatcher, former Arkansas state quarterback, Lane Hatcher. So he uh, he has left um, Jonesboro, Arkansas, and has transitioned over there to Texas State. And while he got off to a little bit of a rough start, he's actually been pretty solid lately. Uh, just uh, on Saturday, now granted, this uh, was against a FCS uh, opponent, but he went 27 for 41, 362 yards, four touchdowns. Uh, he does not offer you really anything in the rush department, but he has had... Uh, 10 passing touchdowns through four games and uh, is well over a thousand yards. Now he goes into Sunbelt play. Uh, what are we thinking as far as Lane Hatcher? Uh, Sunbelt is fun belt. So if you can get a hold right. of these guys, Lane Hatcher has the experience. Um, I love the running back room, especially Calvin Hill. I've had a, I have a show of really compare that I'm hoping pays off. If I sit on one more year that he takes over the reins there, he did transfers, uh, you know, I believe from Arkansas state. So he was the leading rusher there. So I love the weapons around in Texas state. They got people that uh, can kind of get the job done. So I like Lane Hatcher. He's got a good wide receiver to throw to. He's got good running back he can toss off to. So he's got the weapons. Uh, and some belt just opens up more opportunity for, you know, a not so tough opponents like a Baylor or a Nevada or something like that. You can actually play to his strength. So I think Lane Hatcher with that experience and playing tougher opponents ahead of time will actually benefit. And for 7% rostered, that's definitely a guy that I would probably even take Hatcher over Cunningham if I had to pick in waivers, if he doing the prioritization, if I had to choose between the two. Yeah, I think the nice thing with Hatcher here is one, it's it's a system because of how bad their defense is. They they are yeah. playing a lot of catch up. They are involved in a lot of shootouts, so that helps. I also think it helps. Unlike his situation that he had in the past at Arkansas State, there's nobody behind him. He's a guy right. that likes to take risks, and a lot of times that doesn't pay off for him. And he can find himself in a little bit of hot water because he makes mistakes. And then you have to worry about, well, crap, is he going to be splitting with Blackman now? Is he going to be splitting with uh, Logan Bonner? We don't have to worry about that at his new spot. So, yeah, we're getting into fun belt time. So I, he's 7% rostered. I think he's definitely somebody that you at least have to have on your, have to have on your radar. Let's talk about a uh, speaking of, of Maction earlier, and I had alluded to it a little bit this, this week. As we transition from non-conference to conference play, all of a sudden some of these G5 Sunbelt and Maction type of players become more valuable. This is what you've been waiting on. You've, you've been waiting and, and yearning to start Colin Schley. Now is the time. Mm -hmm. yep. Colin Schley's not going to be on this list because he's too damn good. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's owned by too many, too many players. But you know who is on this list is Akron quarterback, DJ Irons. Okay. If you're listening, you're probably thinking the guy's terrible. What is, what has he done so far to warrant me rostering him? Um, he has not shown anything. This is a volume play, mm -hmm. a straight up volume play. He plays in the Joe Moorhead offense, which if anybody's familiar from his time at Mississippi state, was very fruitful for his quarterbacks uh, from a fantasy perspective. To give you an idea of the volume he got, this was against Liberty on Saturday. 52 passing attempts and 14 rushing attempts. It, you will be hard-pressed to find a quarterback that has 66 attempts rushing and, and, and passing together. That is just massive volume. He's had to play against Mississippi State, Tennessee, Liberty. Obviously, they're outmatched from a talent perspective. But now they get into Maction. How are you feeling about DJ Irons? Do you feel like he's worth 
a waiver pickup or would you want to see it a little bit more before you added him? Yeah, DJ Iron Man, like he's always been a guy that I was like, when Matt comes, he might be a, a sleeper. And I, I still kind of feel that I, he's still on my watch list at four percent. Like I said, I probably would rather have Lane Hatcher out of these three. Um, but he plays Bowling Green and then he plays Ohio, which is known just to run. So you're going to get volume on top of volume. You're going to see DJ Iron versus Curtis Rourke, which is going to be a rushing showdown of quarterbacks. Right. That's the fun part about Mac is that we're just going to get these insane like running passing options that are just going to be reducedly crazy. So for me, it's a watch a list situation, but uh, another good spot guy that you could possibly play on the, with the matchups to come. Like I said, Max coming up. So that schedule is getting a lot easier. Yeah. If, if any of you are, are wondering about Joe Moorhead, go back to Mississippi state and, mm-hmm. and look at from, from those years, I want to say it was around 2018, 2019, but look at what Nick Fitzgerald did. And that was against SEC on a play. Nick Fitzgerald, I'm going to let you guys know, Pepper. was a terrible quarterback. But he had great volume, and the rushing is there. I, I think that there's, I think there's some real opportunity here moving forward with DJ Irons. Um, one guy we wanted to mention, as far as honorable mentions, Cole Snyder over at Buffalo. That offense looks a lot different than it did under Lance Leopold, and they are certainly throwing the ball quite a bit more than they did um, prior to prior to um, that coaching change. So keep an eye, keep an eye on that because um, they are, they're kind of slinging it around the field there. And he's got some between Williams and Marshall, he's got some pretty nice receiving options there as well. Any thoughts on him? Uh, I just think it's interesting that all of a sudden Buffalo is a, a pass happy a team when I'm so used to them, right. like a running back like McDuffie or Jarrett Patterson the year before, stuff like that, where we just had a stud running back from Buffalo that you want to draft fairly high in drafts. And now it's like we're just looking to see which receiver is going to keep emerging and, and keep giving Cole Snyder the bump that he needs. Uh, definitely a, a watchable guy. I put him on the watch list. Yeah, absolutely. Let's discuss, let's move on here to running backs as far as our waiver wire options here. So we're kind of, like, like I said, we, we're kind of at that part of the season. we got four weeks under our belt now. We, we are n- now going less off of our projections and more off of what we've actually seen with our own eyes. And so now we've been able to evaluate guys that we had not seen before and mm-hmm. One of the things you'll see in, in, in our running backs here, a reoccurring theme is true freshmen. And we've got a good look at some of these guys. We're going to start here with Richard Reese, the true freshman running back over at Baylor, who his last two games has, he has really stormed onto the scene here with the absence of Tay McWilliams. And obviously we don't know the status of Tay McWilliams as far as when he will return. He suffered a head injury. Um, and, and it, it's, it, they've been very vague at Baylor as far as what his status is, but there's, are we looking at a situation where this running back that's less than 1% rostered has assumed the lead dog role in what's been a very valuable, uh, running back to own there at Baylor 21 attempts, 78 yards and a touchdown with uh, one reception against Iowa State, a very good run defense against Texas State. Like I said, they don't play much defense at Texas State. He murdered nope. them. Nin- 19 rushes, 156 yards, three touchdowns. Also uh, caught a ball for 17 yards there as well. I think the thing that interests me the most here, Brandon, is that 21 carries. The next closest was Squirrel Williams. I want to say around 10 carries Saturday against Iowa State. Quaylen Jones is um, the man of mystery. He comes out, looks great a few right. weeks ago, hasn't done poop since. What are your thoughts on Richard Reese? <laughs> I think uh, this is just one of those like that comes out of nowhere. Like, And even if Tam Williams comes back, who's to say that he can just take the job from Richard Reese? Maybe Reese has earned this spot. Uh, I love the 19 last week, 21 this week. So it's proven that – this team, the Baylor team, that usually will sometimes run almost two running backs. We saw that even last year. Um, all of a sudden, now they put all their faith in just one. And Richard Reese, I mean, he might be the healthiest of them all, but he's got the talent. Uh, you know, I forget which uh, which uh, high school he came out of, but he was pretty decent. I think he was a high three star, if I want to say. Um, so he he's a decent kid. He had a really good run. Uh, you know, he obviously wasn't on the show because I wasn't expecting him for honestly the next couple of years. I wanted to you know, highlight the people and then I wanted to look at, you know, smaller G5 schools. So Reese went under the radar. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so he's a, 
Belleville, Texas. There you go. So he comes from Texas high school football, and that's no joke. That might as well just be like the college playoffs there in Texas when they play high school football. It's ridiculous, man. You saw this all Friday Night Lights, so you know what it's like. Um, So this kid just flew under the radar, and, of course, he stays in Texas, goes with Baylor, and now he's becoming a guy that I don't see can get off the field. Even if if Tay comes back, I still see see Richard Reese in third down options, maybe even Uh the first two. Maybe Tay becomes the third down guy, you know, like – Right. I like this, especially at 1%. This is sneaky good. Uh, I think we briefly mentioned them as honorable mention last week on the pod, uh, and still yeah. 1%. You know, he was a watchless guy. Now he, I think he's a pickup now. So I think right. he's a guy we stash and actually play in spots we need to. The volume is there. And like I said, it's a, it's a, it's a friendly run. It's a running back friendly system that they had there. I think the thing that excites me the most about Richard Reese, you're right. We didn't know anything. I, if you If you were touting Richard Reese, before the season props to you because I, I had never heard of this guy before he, before he played in that first, that week one where he scored a couple of touchdowns, but it was mostly garbage time type stuff. The thing that I like most about him is how complimentary the staff has been about him. They say the staff and other players, Gavin Holmes, a wide receiver also said this. It's no surprise. He's the hardest worker in the room, every practice. And the staff's like the dude continues to get better every single week. So if he's already here getting this volume and they say he gets better every week, then that, you know, this, this may be a, a Wally Pip situation where we may not see as much Tay McWilliams, even when he does come back healthy. Yeah. Now there are, there's always that concern, but there absolutely seems to be a, a uptick in volume taking place here. Now the next two guys we're going to discuss are freshmen. Pretty much everybody had at least a pretty good idea. The first one, we'll talk about is, is Quinshawn Judkins over at Ole Miss. And so he's 15% rostered. Um, he is, man, he has burst onto the scene. And we knew in the spring, based off everything Lane Kiffin said, this guy's going to play. This guy can flat out play. We knew he was going to be a factor. But I don't. I think the thing that interests me the most is – how much Mississippi is running the football. This yeah. is a power run team. The, the, I wanted to mention the, just the absolute contrast in styles here in the Magnolia state, two hours away is Starkville, Mississippi, where on Saturday they ran like 60 plays and threw the ball like 52 times. Meanwhile, over at Ole Miss, they hardly throw the ball. They don't trust either one of their quarterbacks and they know they've got a running back room that is probably second to none other than, you know, the likes of Ohio State. Um, and and I mean, they, they are just running the hell out of the ball. What are your thoughts on Judkins? Um, he had 27 carries, 140 yards and two touchdowns against Tulsa. And that's following up a 19 carry, 98 yard, two touchdown performance against Georgia Tech. Are, is he here to stay? I think he is. And uh Shout out to Matt Bruni. He's the first guy to bring up Judkins. He actually found the freshman yeah. guy. He's been Matt's guy. And so, and so congrats to you, Mr. Matt. Uh, you were definitely on him before I even got a chance to even think about him in, uh, on the future freshman pod. But uh, this guy is incredible. He's a DFS darling. We love him to death because he's usually priced lower because everyone's going to go for Zach Evans. Well, Zach Evans is trying to preserve his legs. The man's trying to go to the NFL, right? So they're going to divvy it up. And it's and Chris K brought up a good point that uh, Ulysses Bentley, even at SMU, wasn't anything to that we were like clamoring over. I think he was necessary for SMU, but now he comes over to Ole Miss and just disappears, and Judkins just takes over his role. So it shows the talent of Judkins as a freshman to outplay Ulysses Bentley, who's had some experience and some touches in college football, regardless if it's SMU or not. SMU's a decent school. So for me, this is just wheels up for Judkins, and when Zach Evans graduates, this is a Judkins show. And until they figure out that quarterback situation, Judkins is one of those guys that I would target, uh, especially if you're in CFF, whether you're trading for him, uh, if you can get him on waivers now, if you're in Dynamite, Dynasty. If someone's got him, go see what you can, you know, pick up for him. Do it before he blows up because next year he's going to be one of those kids that uh, you're going to want to have in probably the first couple of rounds because he's just going to have so much volume and opportunity uh, unless they just bring in another freshman that kind of takes over that role that Jukins had, you know, the previous year. So I'm, I'm excited for Jukins. I think he's worth the pickup. And at 15% roster, this is a steal. So I'd be grabbing him first. Yeah, I think 
I think that's true. If you own if you own Judkins and you're in CFF Dynasty one, you you already are on that train. And oh, yeah. I don't I don't think I even need to tell you this, but do not let go of this man. This man is going unless to it's be a king's ransom. A, right, right. This this guy is going to be a monster for the next couple of years. This is the same um, offensive coordinator. So this is Charlie Weiss's kid when they were at um, FAU together. Kiffin and Weiss's kid, Charlie Weiss Jr had the offense with motor Singletary where he went for 2000 yards and 20 something touchdowns. So this, this is, this is a little bit different from the, um, from the Jeff Levy Lane Kiffin system right. where they tend to share it a lot and spread out the carries. This is, this is a, a coordinator that is not afraid to feed somebody. Obviously you can't just give everything to Judkins when you have Evans sitting right there. That's not going to happen, but you don't have to worry about that next year because I can promise you Evans is gone. Yeah. So Judkins, Judkins has uh, – I, I definitely think he's here to stay for sure. Let's talk about another guy that I think we can both agree is here to stay, and that is Jaden Ott, the true freshman running back over at Cal. He's got a little bit higher roster ship at 24%. Um, but that means there's still a decent chance that he is, that he is out there. Heck, you might've even gotten lucky enough in your league that he, you know, got dropped after a poor performance a couple weeks ago against Notre Dame. He only had 13 carries for 33 yards and, and guys that maybe hopped on him early, maybe hopped back off that train. That's a mistake because on Saturday against Arizona, holy crap, he went for 19 <laughs> carries. 274 yards, three touchdowns. This guy already has nine receptions and 63 yards and a couple touchdowns receiving on the season. So he is a factor in the passing game. He is somebody I know that when in our Slack thread, when I watched, I got around the watching the tape on him. I mentioned it with you guys and, and, and mm-hmm. Colin and, and, and Austin. And I'm like, Oh my goodness. Um, I like a lot of what I see from Jaden Ott. What, what do you think about him, Brandon? Are you there, Brandon? Yep. Sorry. Sorry, I was out. Yep. <laughs> yep, you're good. What What are your thoughts on Jade? Not how 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 much are you willing to invest in him? And are you thinking that Cal can support a true fantasy relevant running back? I think so. Uh, we've seen it in the past, whether it's way back in the day with Marshawn. Are you looking at, um, you know, guys that that's transferred? We just saw one transfer to BYU. He's doing pretty well for himself as well. Um, Jay Nod's an, an incredible athlete, and he just had the right spot. He was just one of those really nice fits. Like, it was one of those freshmen who was like, thank you for, you know, being responsible, looking at all your options, and, like, this is a place where I could immediately make a difference to go along with it. So I'm definitely uh, on board with Jay Nod. Plus, he's going into Pac-12 play. So I'm definitely, you know, that's going to be a little bit easier for him, I think. Uh, I don't see teams like USC really stopping. Oregon will probably be the team you'd have to worry about a little bit. But other than the other ones, I think this is kind of wheels up for Jay Knott as he established himself as the clear, like, top guy in Cal as far as there. And Jack Plummer's not – I mean, just this year, the, you know, Cal's going to have something hopefully a little bit better quarterback next year as uh, recruiting comes along. But uh, Jack Plummer is a good game manager, so he knows what to do. He's going to give it to his top players, so he's going to give it to Ott. So I think he uh, he's here to stay. And I think at 24% rostered, if you can get a hold of the dip that people might have dropped him, especially in redraft, he'd be worth the, to get a hold of. And if, you, uh, if you're in Dynasty, it's a little too late. But uh, uh, if you got him, good job. Right, no doubt. Um, I, I think he's the type of player that – when we talk about Pac-12 after dark, man, he's he's the type of guy that you're going to go to bed if you're facing him thinking that you've won your week and you're going to wake up a loser because he's going to put up some really big some really big games uh, late at night. I'm trying to pull up. Let's see. I pulled up his playoff schedule. Um, I'm always – we're kind of transitioning to that. Okay, if you're a relevant team, now you got to start looking at what do the playoff weeks look like. you got to start setting yourself up for – for the playoff run. And he has at Oregon state week 11 Stanford at home week 12. That's a really nice matchup. Stanford yeah. looks like, like trash. Um, <laughs> and then UCLA uh, in the championship championship week in week 13, which is also a, you know, we, we know how chip Kelly's defenses usually go. So that's, that's not bad either. So as far as semifinals and championship week, that's uh that's fairly appealing there. Yeah. 
Last running back. Uh, sorry, we have a couple more running backs. Marshawn Lloyd, somebody that I wanted to talk about today. Certainly not a true freshman. Certainly not a new guy coming onto the scene. This is a five-star bona fide stud coming out of, uh, of high school. Um, he has had a little bit of a resurgence lately. And I was, I was curious what might happen to his ownership um, after facing Georgia last week. Because everybody knew that was not going to be pretty for South Carolina or any of the running backs there. And it was not, Mm -hmm. but against Charlotte, now granted Charlotte is literally one of the worst, if not the worst defense in all of college football, 15 carries, 169 yards, three touchdowns. He didn't have anything in the receiving game that week, but he has shown a propensity to catch the ball in previous weeks, already 10 catches, hundred yards and a touchdown. He's become kind of Spencer Rattler's check down option. A lot of the times here. That offense has proven to once again be a very run-based offense. How are you feeling about Marshawn Lloyd? And and tell me, Brandon, where would you of 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 the the four that we've discussed so far? Where would he rank for you amongst these guys? Um, so Lloyd's one of those. I don't know. He's just been around for so long. He's just one of those guys that you always see on the waivers, and you're like, I could just take Lloyd one week and I'll be okay. It's the SEC matchups that are kind of. That's what holds a lot of people back a lot of times, especially as you get you know further into the into the season. Mm-hmm. But uh, between them, I probably would say a much actually rather have probably Judkins, uh, uh, probably Ott first, and then probably Judkins, and then I'd probably take my shot on Richard Reese before Marshawn Lloyd, uh, just because we've been programmed in the past couple of years to be like Marshawn Lloyd's going to eventually just kind of disappear again. But it doesn't seem that way in South Carolina, at least this year. Um, I was expecting a lot more out of the uh, out of the passing game of South Carolina just with all the weapons they've occurred, but you haven't seen anything. And I know, uh, you know guys like Corey Rucker and those guys have been injured and things like that. So it's like they haven't had that one, but they have players and then yeah. they're just not passing it. And I know they've had some rough matchups, especially against Georgia, but this seems like a more of a run balanced team. So I think Lloyd might prove us all wrong that you know, he's not just one of those spot start guys anymore that he kind of, he could be rostered in that what is he at 32%? So he's one of the higher ones owned. Right. Uh, he might run under the radar because people are like, oh, well, he might, you know, be on there in the next couple of weeks. So you yeah. know, might be sneaky enough to, you know, at least put him on the bench for right now and see what happens. You mentioned the word spot start there. I think that's key um, because it's South Carolina and they do play one of the toughest schedules yep. in the country. Now they, they've got Georgia in their rear view. So they don't have to worry about that matchup anymore. But spot start, they play South Carolina State next week. Um, so that's a really that's a really good situation. But then it gets hairy again. Kentucky, Texas A and M. You got Missouri and Vanderbilt after that. But the problem, I think, the problem that I have with Lloyd that playoff schedule. If you're gearing up for the playoffs at Florida, Tennessee, at Clemson, of course they always have Clemson to finish off the season. So it really is difficult to justify having any any South Carolina guys in, in that final week starting lineup, but yeah, definitely a really good spot start for next week, South Carolina state last running back. We'll discuss here. Uh, probably rostered even less maybe than Richard Reese right around there. 1% was a guy that uh, made a little bit of a name for himself on Saturday. And that is Jordan bird running back San Diego state against Toledo. 16 carries, 115 rushing yards, two touchdowns. He gives you nothing, literally nothing in the pass game, zero receptions on the season. And he had not done much up until this point. Um, I mean, he had less than 20 carries on the season up till this point. What do we think about him? And, And the reason why we're discussing him is because this is a program that has shown an ability to have a fantasy relevant running back. Is he worth it? Do you think? Um, so uh, it's more like uh, we were all hoping what chance bell that was going to be kind of the guy that was going to yeah. take the realm here and just being able to kind of take a look at San Diego stake and just kind of looking at uh, things like projecting what, like how they're splitting their carries and stuff like that. Jordan bird, since I think week two has gradually just moved up every single week as far as this percentage. So it's like bird has yeah. gone up. Bell has disappeared. And so now he's kind of emerging as the guy that they're starting to trust. So especially after this week, going from six to, to 16, that's a big deal for me. That's that's proven that the coaching staff trusts him. 
he's being relied upon. And even if it's injury or they're just trying to figure out the situation is that they're relying on Jordan Burke to kind of get it. So at 1% rostered, uh, that's intriguing to me. Uh, better matchups are still ahead, even past Toledo. So another one of those guys could be a, uh, a steal to to grab watch list for me now uh but especially at 1% i think you could probably wait another couple of weeks but not too much longer especially right. as another performance rate goes another 16 you know rushes for sure yeah i think if you're in a deeper league you get ahead of the curve here and, and yep. you go ahead if you're in a real deep league you go ahead and add you know and, and just kind of see how it plays out bell's been a little dinged up you just kind of see if bird can kind of take over the job if you're in a standard league, yeah, this is probably a watch list, but just somebody we kind of wanted to point out to you just because of how good that system has been historically. Let's move on to some, some wide receivers here. And if, if you've listened to me, if you've read any of my articles, you know how much I believe in Robert and a, and that Syracuse system that comes over from Virginia. The first guy we want to talk about here is a Rondé Gadsden the second, his father, NFL player, Rondé Gadsden. Uh, he is the wide receiver for Syracuse that has really, really come on strong the last two games. Uh, recently against Virginia, seven catches, 107 yards. Uh, I want to say he had 13 targets. Don't quote me on that. Purdue the week before that is where he really made, uh, you know, made some money for people. Six catches, 112 yards, two touchdowns. If you know this system, you know that it can it can support a passing a, a, a passing game that is good enough for a wide receiver to shine, even if the quarterback throwing the ball is as bad at throwing the ball <laughs> as the one that they have. Yep. Schrader's not great. It is a great system, though. Dontavian Wicks, look how good he was last year versus how good he is now. Mm. This, this, this is a really good system. We're talking about a guy that's 0% owned. How do you feel about um, around the guess? And are you buying into this system? Can it support a fantasy relevant wide receiver? Yeah, uh, I was actually invested in this system. Uh, you know, just seeing the difference. Uh, I think when we did our, our summit here earlier in the springtime, uh, you know, we were having a, trying to figure out, you know, what we thought about uh, Schrader versus, you know, Armstrong now and stuff like that. I was looking at Courtney Jackson. So clearly I was wrong. We got the wrong wide receiver. So actually Gatson was the one to emerge. So I'm happy to see, now we finally have a wide receiver we can target in the Syracuse offense. So um, I, I was pretty happy to see kind of one kind of do it, especially going for six and then seven receptions the past two weeks. That's uh, what I want to see is just even if the yards aren't there, just the opportunity to score with the touchdowns and getting targeted is what I look for. So uh, for me, jumping from three to six and then out seven, that's definitely what I want to see moving forward. So sure, is finally starting to trust Gatson as his guy that he can look for, whether it's deep or for short passes in, in general. So definitely happy. And for zero percent, that's a uh, criminal. You should at least uh, you should be looking to pick him up. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I think he's a player you want to add. You maybe don't want to start yet, but you right. want to add just in case. And you you maybe want to see another week of success before you actually throw him into your starting lineup. But there's there's definitely potential there. Speaking of system potential, let's move on to Wake Forest wide receiver Jamal Banks. This is uh, this is another guy that has really produced the last two weeks, even though we had heard next to nothing about this guy coming into the season. Uh, just recently against Clemson in this shootout that we saw from Hartman and DJU, Jamal Banks went for six catches, 141 yards, and two touchdowns. And that follows up a game against Liberty where he also had six catches, just 55 yards, but two of those six catches came in the end zone. So he's got five touchdown catches on the season. Wake Forest historically has had wide receivers come out of nowhere to be really, really successful. I promise you nobody was owning A.T. Perry in weeks one through two or three last year, but about this time is when he stormed onto the scene. Now, can Wake support two wide receivers with Banks and Perry? What are your thoughts on Banks, Brandon? Yeah, um, we even have Donovan Green, who's uh, actually you know shown to be pretty decent as well in his return to the lineup. So new question is, can Sam Hartman support almost three wide receivers at any given week. And it sounds like as long as he's in a, 
a matchup where it can, can uh, he can let it loose, it's possible. Um, I think Banks is uh, a red zone target, and that's what I've seen. Even in his first game against VMI, he only had one catch for 14 yards, but guess what? It was a touchdown in the end zone, right? So that's kind of what uh, Harmon's looking for Banks in the red zone, and that's kind of what we want to see is some guy that can be a big target and kind of do it that way. So even if A.T. Perry is going to take up the majority of these you know, catches and stuff like that, I think Banks is a good sneaky play. Love it for DFS. Actually, don't mind it for the pickup. I don't think we start him right away. Uh, but if he's in a matchup, uh, I don't know. I think they, they play Carolina. If not, they play him in the next year or so. But, you know, play him in the shootouts where, you know, the defense on the other side isn't good and Jamal Banks will stand out, especially as a guy that he'll look for in the red zone. So he's definitely worth, I think, picking up. A 0% roster, once again, criminal for these ACC receivers not getting picked up. Yeah, I think he's definitely somebody you have to look at in a dynasty format as well. Sure. He's he's listed as a sophomore. I believe his true freshman year was actually 2020, the COVID year. So, um, you know, he's got some eligibility left. If this is A.T. Perry's last year there, um, which we are anticipating that it is, obviously he, he is working his way into that that lead role, which is which is very valuable. But yes, um, potential for both of them to be successful as well. So another guy that's, man, we've got a lot of really low roster ship guys. We had, we had some guys really put together a couple of nice back-to-back weeks here. Tyler Scott, wide receiver at Cincinnati. Here's what he's done the last two weeks. Against Indiana on Saturday, 10 catches, 185 yards, three touchdowns. The week before that, Miami of Ohio, eight catches, 119 yards and a tutty as well. This is a guy that has really, really produced over the last two weeks. And we're seeing this kind of evolution of the Cincinnati offense with Ben Bryant that is all of a sudden become more pass oriented than anybody expected. They can't figure out who their go-to running back is. So it's almost like they're just like, screw it. We're just going to throw the ball over the field. Then what are, what are your thoughts on, on Tyler Scott, I know he's a guy that you had mentioned uh, you, you're pretty psyched about. Yeah, uh, I've mentioned him in our Slack channel. I actually have him in Dynasty. I'm probably the 1% that owns him here on Fantrax. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I picked him up uh, right before the season. You know, we had our uh, supplementary and freshman draft, had a few more spots. And I was like, you know what? I, I really want to see if I can find a guy that can be almost Alec Pierce-like. I'm not saying that Tyler Scott is Alec Pierce, but I'm saying that Cincinnati always is they, – they need some type of wide receiver because they can't – bank on the run all the time they don't have Jerome Ford like I said I was kind of trying to figure out the run game I was like this has to be the narrative where they're going to start passing and sure enough they did so Tyler Scott who I played in my flicks went for 46.5 fantasy points this past week and the week before he went off for over 26 fantasy points so the guys even in a flex spot is doing good now there's going to be some spots where some of my studs uh, are sitting down so you know guys like you know, you don't sit down Josh Downs, but guys like Quentin Johnson who's struggling or the guys that we thought were our studs, you might be able to sit them down for a guy like Tyler Scott could be that could be a consistent week-by-week week play, and he's shown that, especially, I would say, in the past three games, uh, but more so in the past two where he's just gone yeah. off and gone nuclear. So I don't think him go nuclear every game. There's You know, you don't get Miami, Ohio, and Indiana back-to-back every single year, but uh, he's a junior, so you can pick him up for redraft. Um, and then even Dynasty, if, you know, you can grab – at the 1% roster, you get at least one more year out of him. I doubt that he'll go NFL. I think you can probably give us one more year before he moves off if he goes to the shot there. So I say Tyler Scott would be the pickup of choice for me, even with all these great studs. Uh, I, I've seen what Tyler Scott can do in a flex spot. So I'm, I'm yeah. down. I like it. Um, rostering a Cincinnati wide receiver in a standard league is not something that I would have expected prior to the season. <laughs> um, but here we are. And if, if this offense has changed to, a little, to be a little bit more pass friendly, and we've got a guy that's got 18 catches over the last two games, that is uh, that certainly has my attention. No doubt. Yeah. Let's talk about Jared Brown. This is a uh, wide receiver for coastal Carolina who had a just an absolute monster game on Thursday night. Some people may forget about this because, uh, you know, it, it was not played on Saturday. But on Thursday, he went for five catches, 129 yards, two touchdowns, and also was a factor coming out of the backfield. Four carries, 27 yards as well. I believe he even had like a another like 60-yard touchdown called back uh, due to um, a penalty. So, this is not a guy that's done much prior to this. How confident are we that 
we this is a glimpse of of what's to come to where we can project that this is going to continue um or is this a little bit of a mirage what are your I'm, thoughts Brent? i'm hoping it's not a mirage i am surprised nate that it's five percent awesome already because i just for me like i was looking at sam pickney and then i was hoping that you know deandre coleman the freshman was going to emerge you know just for jealous purposes you know he was one of my big fish small ponds that i was hoping that was going to kind of come out be that wide receiver two then become a wide receiver one but jared brown has been surprising he's been used almost a little bit like an army knife there uh being in the rush in the past i'm not saying he's luther burden levels but it was nice to see the production being used as well um i at five percent at still wait and see for me so i probably put him on the watch list um, but a lot of people will be picking them up and I don't blame you because coastal, like I said, sunbelt fun belt. So it's going to, it's yeah. going to get fun real quick. And I think Jared Brown, especially if he can continue this, I don't think it's a mirage. That's what I'm getting at, but yeah. I don't know. I still want to wait and see me personally, but I'd still, you might be able to get ahead of the curve if you go ahead and grab them though. I, th- I think I'm with you. I think, I think watch list is, is where I am at with him as well. Let's talk about our last wide receiver here is uh Decorian Clark wide receiver. University of Texas, San Antonio. He is a 20% roster ship. Clark currently sits as wide receiver five on the season. That is not something we expected. Obviously, this is a system that can support very productive wide receivers. We've seen that the last couple of years. But because of his output on Saturday, where he against Texas Southern went for nine catches, 217 yards and three touchdowns. He has vaulted himself up in the top 10 wide receivers uh, scoring so far for CFF purposes. Now, hadn't had a 100-yard game prior to that, but volume was there. Five catches, seven catches, six catches. Uh, And he's a big target, unlike some of the other receivers that they have there at UTSA. I believe he's I want to say he's like in the six foot two, 210 pound range. So um, what are your thoughts on him? And do you see this continuing? Uh, I do. Um, and uh, so far, um, we'll look back at his all his, his entire weeks and stuff like the lowest weekly finish that he's had so far is wide receiver 36. So he's definitely in the mix so far for UTSA. Um, I haven't heard too much from Zachary Franklin. I don't know if he's a little dinged up, if he's just not producing. Maybe Frank Harris isn't. Oh, he had a he had a, he scored as well. They, okay. they just they went they went nuclear against Texas Southern. Um, so every everybody got everybody got action in that one. Yeah. Uh, so correction, it wasn't wide receiver thirty six, wide receiver forty one. Sorry about that. Um, but still, uh, I mean, I get it. It's Texas Southern, but even against uh, Texas, he still had five targets, and against Army, he had seven targets. I guess a tough Houston team, he had six. So he's getting the target share. So that's what I'm looking for is a solid wide receiver two. Um, sometimes he can be wide receiver one if uh, Zakari disappears in that week. So so I, I think Frank Harris is probably the main reason because the dude is just an absolute stud, especially in the past in the run. Uh, UTSA is just so much fun. Those run runners, man, the meat meets, man. They're just – there's a ton of fun to watch. Uh, so I'm, I'm stoked. Uh, our friend Joshua Chevalier actually played to Corey and Clark against me this past week, and he dropped – Another 46 Ooh. points. Luckily, I had Tyler Scott on the other side. So it's like, you know, we're trying to mastermind one another. Right. Uh, of course, the correction, the uh, the, the b- swap out worked correctly this time. So he, his b- correct and beat me by a whole point. <laughs> so it is what it is. That's where the, uh, you know, the the swap out gets you. But at the same time, it was fair because he really didn't know one of those guys wasn't starting and he had already locked. So that's yeah. what the that's what the swap is for for the zeros. Um, so a little, it hurts a little bit, but hey, this is what I'm saying. To coin Tyler Scott, these are guys that can get you some W's, and they're being overlooked because they're in such a, I would say smaller G5 play, and a lot of people are focusing on these studs uh, out of the ACC or you know even the the Big 12 and stuff like that. Give me out of these five that we've listed so far here between Gadsden, Banks, Scott, Brown and Clark, how would you rank them as far as your priority on waivers? Sure. Uh, Clark first, uh, just because he's getting the momentum. Probably Scott, because the way he's getting used next. Then I'm going to say Gadsden, uh, Banks, and then I'd say Brown because he's more my watch guy. Give him one more week or so, and then I'm taking him. Uh, even some of the honorable mentions, uh, that's some of those I would be interested in as well. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's just bring up a couple of those real quick here. Um, your boy Antoine Green, North Carolina, uh, breaks He's his uh, break, breaks his, his collarbone early in the season. I believe was his injury, and um, has to sit out a couple games. 
comes in, does really nice. I believe he had uh, what three? What do you have? Three catches, uh, right around 100 yards and a touchdown or something like that. He had about 30 fantasy points total in the game, which yeah. is great. Right on up there with Josh Downs. Uh, just happy to have him back. It's good to see three right. out there. This is his last, very last year, so he's definitely not a dynasty player. I have him, so I'm just happy to have him yeah. off my uh, my bench. Um, but at the same time, like he's a great pickup for a spot start. I wouldn't say mm-hmm. he would be a guy you play every single week just because you have downs to factor in. You also right. have Nesbitt and a few others. Uh, this is the one thing about North Carolina. They've gotten better about passing the ball around this year versus there. But uh, for those that are looking at Kobe Pace or Gavin Blackwell, I'd say wait on those now that we yeah. have the starters back. J.J. Jones is a guy you should maybe look at too because he's being targeted as wide receiver three. Um, but I'm glad that Green's back. He definitely would be worth a guy that I would I would pick up and throw on the bench for sure. I'm interested in any North Carolina wide receivers for two reasons. One, they have Drake May throwing the ball to them. And two, yep. they have uh, – uh, they're going to have to throw the ball all damn game long because yes. that defense is just hemorrhaging points. So yes. um, the other couple here, Ja'Cory Brooks, uh, pains me to say, just because we've got <laughs> our our, our, our bet. bet. I got I got a feeling I'm going to be singing some Britney Spears song at some point because of our bet with uh, burning the red shirt. Uh, but it looks like Ja'Cory Brooks has um, – emerged to say the least he had seven targets six catches 117 yards and two touchdowns recently against Vanderbilt so he, he's he's kind of doing what everybody had expected when the season started um, and then my guy man Tez Walker Devontez Walker wide receiver yep. over at over at Kent State Colin Schley is not afraid to throw the ball deep to that man who is lightning fast and he is making plays downfield he had over 100 yards receiving and a touchdown against Jared Georgia. wanted Georgia defense, man. <laughs> That's so, so nuts. Yeah, deep, deep sleeper that is uh, turning out to be a pretty solid uh, pickup for, for this season. So that's really nice. Let's transition here to just a couple of tight ends that we've got. A um, couple of guys that we wanted to highlight that have come on strong recently here that um, I imagine their roster ship is, is very low as well, too. And the first one we'll discuss is Cade Stover, tight end, Ohio State. Um, here, here's what he's done recently. Four catches, 451 yards, and two touchdowns against Wisconsin. Obviously a very good defense. Uh, prior to that, against Toledo, he had three catches for 83 yards. Volume still low. He hasn't received more than four catches in a game. I have my concerns about how much Ryan Day really wants to use a tight end. There's really not a whole lot of evidence historically backing this up that that a tight end will be the focus of the offense when you have literally the best wide receivers the world's ever seen at your disposal. But he had overwhelmingly good camp reports, and Stroud said this guy is a bona fide stud during the spring. Um, what are your thoughts on Cade Stover, Brandon? So I know this is a CFF show, but this is for my C2C people that are listening from our team and stuff like that, as well as the people that kind of listen to us on the regular. Ohio State tight ends get drafted. So the, you don't have to worry about him not going to NFL because he's going to. Now, is he going to be a guy that you can play on a weekly basis on an NFL roster? Probably not. Because uh, and, and let's look at it. This is Ohio State. They're waiting for JSN to get fully healthy. It's wide receiver city here. Look at the lineup they have just waiting in the wings as far as their recruits and stuff like that. This is going to be a wide receiver pass happy team for a long time to come. It's just very rare that you see the tight end uh, pick up those ones. I think it's a lot of times. And I think that's why Stroud trust him is because he does get him out of some sticky situations sometimes that Stroud has to check the ball off or he needs that tough, uh, say he's like third and three, he needs those three yards. He's going to give it to Stover because he's just there and available. So Stover's got the catching. Uh, it's just the targets, like you're saying, that's where uh, at 2% rostered, I think that's a wait for me. Uh, it's going to mm-hmm. be watch list. Yeah. Uh, I just need to see if maybe that four and uh, 51, the two touchdowns was nice, but I think that came out of necessity. Uh, just to make sure that they stayed ahead of Wisconsin and, and never looked back there. The, Wisconsin yeah. usually is a really good team. It's just Ohio State's so high octane. It's just hard to stop the train. Uh, even, even Notre Dame struggled against Ohio State. So just one of those teams to where, like, you know, it's, it's just hard to stop them. So, but for me, I, out of all those weapons, I would have to see more targeted use for me to want to even put him on a bench or a spot start. So for me, it's a watch for, for now. Yeah, he's, he's definitely a watch list guy. I think in deeper leagues, you can definitely do worse than Cade Stover. My mm-hmm. fear is, and this is what we ran into with Jeremy Ruckert, was yeah. uber-talented player, and he would have 
two games a year where he'd blow up for six catches, 100 yards, and two touchdowns. The only problem was you had absolutely no clue when those games were coming. And exactly. the rest of the, and the rest of the season, all the other weeks, he was sub five points because he just didn't have volume in this offense. So I think that's my only concern with Cade Stover. But if if you're in a deeper league and you can wait out those weeks, sure, you, you can definitely do worse um, than that. Um, last guy that we're going to discuss here, Arkansas State tight end. I'm going to absolutely butcher his name. Oh, yeah, uh, than me. I, I'm going to give it I'm going to give it a shot here. Seidou Seidou Treori. That sounds that? good. No Seidou Seidou Treori. Um, so I this is a guy that I actually picked up in a deep dynasty uh, league prior to this week um, because he absolutely was was a, just a beast against Memphis two weeks ago. He had six catches, 120 yards, and a touchdown. Um, and I believe in that game he had 11 targets. And then against ODU, not a bad G5 defense, seven catches, 81 yards. What I like about him, so he actually comes by way of, I want to say Britain. He was part of like their um, football NFL development program that they've got overseas over there. He's really athletic. I've, I've watched him play a little bit. He moves like a wide receiver, um, and I want to say he's right around like 6'4", 225-ish. Uh, you know, I mean, he's, he's basically the size of Traylon Burks. Um, yeah. But he's somebody that less than 1% owned. I think he, people need to kind of pay attention to this guy because we know that there is a ton of volume in that Arkansas State pass game. Champ Flemings has been hurt. Trevelyan's Hunt has been hurt up until this week. Jeff Foreman has underproduced. What are your thoughts on on, on Treori and, um, and and do you think that this is real or a mirage? I, uh, once again, don't think it's a mirage. I think it is out of necessity with the injuries mm-hmm. coming up. However, I think as the more that he establishes himself, that they're going to keep relying on him to go along with it, especially moving up from two to then six to seven targets. That's what I want to see is a consistent move up, like we were talking about with some of the other receivers that we saw as well. Uh, 120 yards against Memphis, that's nothing to bat an eye out. That's, uh, that's pretty fantastic if you can do a, 120 yards and one touchdown on Memphis. So I think that's pretty good, especially for an Arkansas State team that was supposed to be out of that fight. And the fact that they kept it pretty decently close to 44-32, that's still, still pretty decent to me. A 0% rostered. Uh, that's interesting to me. And then now the fact that you said you have them deep rostered, that intrigues me because usually you're a man that likes to uh, scout all areas. And the fact that you found this guy, that uh, that perks my interest. So I think he would be a guy that I would probably put on my, my high watch list and maybe even a roster spot on my bench and see see what we can do there. Yeah, I, I'll totally admit the roster that I that I have him on was hurting it tight end something. There fierce. you go. Diamond the but, but But I was a – when. I, I am the type of person kind of like Michael Trigg. I, I want a tight end with that, um, with that ceiling, with that athleticism that can, like he has the last two games combined for 200 yards over the last two games. That's, that's not something you normally get out of a tight end. So that's, that's certainly got my, uh, my interest. So that will, that will pretty much wrap up our, uh, our week that was our recap week here and, and waiver wires and freak out scales. Um, Brandon, is there, is there anything of note that you've got coming up that you wanted to, uh, to, to hype up a little bit here or. Sure. I'd always, you know, I'm always going to plug the, the bet on C2C podcast coming up. Uh, we have our guest, we have Mr. Alfred Fernandez there. You know him from yes. the official. He also does a little bit of, uh, betting and stuff like that. And he also does the uh, weekly contest, which I encourage you guys to do for uh, DFS on DraftKings. You can win a home field gift card. So definitely hit up Alfred if you're interested in that. We'll talk a little bit about um, some some betting lines, how he approaches that and how he approaches setting up his DFS lineups as uh, uh, he talks with us, with me, Chris and, uh, and Ethan. So that should be a pretty fun episode. Maybe sneaking a little bit of recruiting talk a little bit, but uh, I know uh, they won't stand for much of that. So I'll try to do the best I can, but camp prompts a lot of recruiting stuff, but tune in for the DFS best part uh, I think is going to be pretty fantastic this week dude I love listening to Alfred I think my favorite part about listening to Alfred is he has such a distinct like kind of almost calming yeah. voice in the way that he talks what I found so funny is in our in our chats on slack when he types something out I can hear him talking 
when yeah. I read it. It's so he has he has one of those. He's so knowledgeable, but he has such a distinctual way in which in which he talks that I can I can hear it whenever I read it through text. So and the great part uh, is he's never going to hear any of this because he doesn't watch the content. So he, we'll just have absolutely. to say nice things to him in Slack. Like, hey, Alfred, we mentioned you. Good day, buddy. He absolutely <laughs> will not. Well, Brandon, I want to thank you for coming on. I want to encourage everybody. Uh, that is listening to also listen to the Chasing the Natty um, recording that will come out Wednesday with Jared and Chris Moxley. Be sure to listen to that. Uh, they'll, they'll inevitably post some uh, st sit start questions. So be sure uh, on Twitter to chime in with those and they will be able to answer your questions as far as uh, any sit start things that you have coming up. I want to uh, thank producer Jared, who's been uh, chirping in our ears. I have a new appreciation for uh, all of the guys that do commentary on TV and have producers chirping in their ears and can carry on two thoughts at the same time and be able to speak clearly. So um, I, I appreciate Jared as well for that. Everybody, please have a great rest of your day and the rest of your week and good luck with all things college fantasy football. Peace.